thank you very much for those presentations and uh, giving us examples of how you're using uh, uh, digital health and artificial intelligence machine learning tools. So in this segment, uh, we're going to have a question and answer and uh, sort of try to get into the weeds about some of the questions our viewers may have. Um, and again, uh, thank you, David, Maya, and Thierry for, uh, and uh, Anthony for being part of the uh, panel. Um, so I want to start with, uh, uh, with Thierry, and that is um, the question has come up about migrating from descriptive analytics to predictive analytics to prescriptive analytics. And it's been observed that um, when you're starting out with using or attempting to use artificial intelligence uh, or other data science techniques, it's kind of hard to go from one to the next to the next. So I'm wondering whether you can kind of walk us through the issues that you ran into trying to migrate from descriptive to predictive to prescriptive in your institution. Uh, I think uh, in our case, it was really not a problem. Uh, the, the implementation, re really the challenge I think in AI is uh, you have this design by the administration or by the scientist and it looks great on paper. You have lots of, you can have tons of meetings between the administration and the IT. And then when you talk to the docs there, they say, whoa, uh, that, this is too much of a change. I can do that, you know, and you have this resistance. So the story for us was simple. We, we involved the physicians right away. So we had permanent uh, discussion uh, about this, I mean, when we say, okay, we're gonna help you guys to manage the wait list because you don't want to have always patient coming in emergency. We can certainly do a better job at predicting what happens on the wait list and how to maximize the, 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 the resources, how we can operationalize this. And every, every night, actually, the, there was one surgeon, one uh, anesthesiologist who was meeting and talking with the, what we call the triage nurse here would present them with the uh, results of the algorithm and they would discuss it and they were very happy. And now they would not do it without the, 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 the algorithm. So it's all about involving the physicians very early in the game, the, the people who are in the trenches, because the, the AI, if you don't do that, may be perceived as uh, forcing an issue and uh, supporting more the administration and the, uh, and, uh, and the financing department than really the clinical care. So for us, we ended up having much less cancellation, uh, better outcomes. Uh, I mean, the, the length of the ICU reduced dramatically because they were much better screened and, uh, and, and, the, and the algorithm worked. And actually we offered that to other centers in Ontario and uh, it's available online. So I think to me, I don't see a problem when the physicians, the end users, actually the front users, <laughs> will be involved. That's the challenge that all the AI business has in hospitals. They see that if you present this as something which is more complicated, another layer to their complications on their every day, it would never work. So Anthony, do you want to address that issue? Um, you're always, um, I think appropriately, preaching early involvement of clinician input into data science projects if they're going to work. Uh, do you want to amplify on that? Yeah, I, I totally agree um, with theory that rather than have an AI methodology or a technology and you're trying to sell it, uh, uh, we, we've just, within uh, early phases of our institute that focus on AI, we just go right to the clinicians, the frontline people, and just say, get, we just get a survey of the problems that are very pervasive in the institution and try to design a methodology around that. I think a very tangible example is um, the ER um, doctors wanted some way of having a better prediction tool and we basically handcrafted one uh, and not just have like a EHR based uh, prediction tool, which, you know, doesn't always work. So you, you kind of have to go to the users and on the front line to get an appreciation for um, what problems they need to be solved. And then you've already taken care of the selling part because it's something that they want in the first place. And better yet, you can even get them involved in the project. 
and they get excited about it. And that's how I think you build um, a coalition of champions in your institution. Yeah, I agree with uh, that. Go ahead. You, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, happy to, to um, provide a, a perspective. Because I, I really do think that within healthcare AI, we can think about different types of problems. There's our operational problems and then our clinical problems. Um, our clinical problems are a little bit more challenging. And definitely when it comes to um, engagement of say physicians or nursing and clinical staff, so important because our clinicians are pretty data savvy. And so they're not going to be as, um, they, they wanna understand, they want that explainable AI if AI is going to be used. They wanna be able to identify and have that connection um, that intuitive connection with the AI solution uh, to their clinical training and, and um, experience as scientists. Um, whereas for operational AI, similarly, are often our, our, the problems that need to be solved, um, sometimes they're not as, as life and death, right? It's, sometimes it's just the billing. How do we make billing a little bit more automated? Um, how do we use... Um, predictive analytic solutions uh, to better streamline our operations. And in that, those cases, um, actually I found often our, our champions just want a solution. Uh, they're less, they have a problem, they want a solution and automating that in a prescriptive manner through automation, uh, far less barrier, you know, um, than in, in a clinical use case. Um, and again, billing automation is a great example of prescriptive analytics where um, it really is um, that automated um, solution that, that you can have a dashboard on your billing lag time, uh, but when you actually have an automation uh, tool that allows for that lag time to be shortened, then everyone's happy. I'm sure David has some, some comments there as well because he's very impressive on how he's been able to incorporate it within operations. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, the one thing I would say is, you know, I'm an IT guy that's not very interested in IT. So I think a lot of times with things like AI, we get interested in the technology ourselves, and then we want to tell everybody about it because we're excited. I would argue that the people I work with couldn't care less whether this was AI or a report or data or whatever, just as much as they couldn't care whether it's a Dell server or a Cisco server that's running their EMR. They just want it to run. Now, at the flip side of the argument, there is a case for clinicians where if I'm going to be using this information to make healthcare decisions about my patient, at least I want to have some level of understanding. But I really struggle with in the long term how that's going to happen because AI is going to get more and more sophisticated. And in my experience, certainly with our foundation of folks, like I talked about, they just I confused them the moment I started talking about even trying to put it in lay people's terms, how this worked. And they said, we'll judge whether it works because people will either donate or not. And so I wrestle between this need to explain and justify and just the fact that people want a solution that works. And certainly in the non-clinician area, I would argue that we have to be really careful of, that we're excited about it. So we want to tell the world, I don't know that it really matters at the end of the day, as long as it works. And so, um, you know, it's a difficult, it's a difficult question. Certainly if in a physician was treating my kid using an AI algorithm, I probably would want to make sure they understood it. But from an other perspective, I, I don't know that we're spending a long time trying to explain things that aren't that important. So I've described um, and others have described an execution or AI readiness, and it's sort of a spin on innovation readiness. And just, I came up with this 5i thing. And, and basically, most of these projects walk along a certain roadmap. The first is what I call ideate, that is, what's the problem and who has it? And we're all familiar with a solution looking for a problem, and that generally doesn't work. So the first is customer discovery. Who's the customer? What's their problem? What's the pain point? Da, da 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 da. The second then is okay. I think I have an understanding of who has the problem and what it is, um, which is not easy. Um, but so now I'm going to create a solution. So you're going to you're going to essentially create a product or something, a software, an algorithm, a roadmap, or something to try to address the jobs, pains, and gains they want you to do. So. Essentially, you're creating internal product market fit. And then once you come up with that, then you just have to figure out a way, well, how do I integrate this into what I'm already doing? And 
that brings up the issue of organizational ambidexterity, which is, hey, look, I got to keep the lights on. I got to keep the revenue flowing. But at the same time, we don't want to preempt anybody with a good idea that might help us grow in the future. So it's this, you know, it's this McKinsey now the next and the new paradigm. How do, how do you maintain focus on operations, but at the same time, kind of walk your way to the next phase. Maybe it's a new product, maybe it's a new market, maybe it's a new business model, but you don't want to get too crazy with it because it's just going to upset the apple cart. And then they're the totally out of the box ideas that basically will make your existing business model obsolete before somebody else does. Um, so that's kind of the integration issue. And then there's, okay, we think we got this figured out. Now we got to convince people to use it, which is the dissemination and implementation process. And as we've talked about, there's a lot of resistance from a lot of different stakeholders, not the least of which in sick care, because we're so risk averse and we're so change averse that it's a pretty big ball to push up the hill and keep falling back on you. So there are the implementation challenges. And then finally, there are the metrics, the indicators, the key performance indicators, the impact, the ROI, how do you measure all that stuff? And then based on what we find, did we do this right or we have to go back to the beginning and start all over again in some sort of continuous quality improvement loop? So to me, those are kind of the big headline steps that a lot of these projects take. Now, having said that, my question is, so there's a lot of stakeholders in this game and, and four of the main ones are the C-suite and the finance people, the operations people, the clinical people, and sort of the IT people or the IS people. And, and to me, they all seem to have a different need and, a, and they want a different value proposition. So the C-suite, as David indicated, we don't care how this works. We, we just want you to you know, satisfy our mission and make sure that we're meeting our numbers in the finance, particularly in finance operations, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, the operations people want, don't screw up our workflow. Just, we, we don't want all this to, don't make our life more complicated than it already is. The clinical people want their deal, they want you know, they want to be able to spend more time with patients. They want better outcomes. They certainly don't want you to screw up their workflow or their, uh, how they do things. They want to make money. They want income from all of this. Don't give me something that's going to reduce my income 30%. Um, and they don't want to get sued. So don't give me something that's going to expo you know, expose me to more liability like AI. So they have their deal. And then these people in the middle, God love them, are the IT folks or the IS folks that sort of have to make all this happen and satisfy the interests of those stakeholders. So my, you know, we say that these projects should and must start with the clinician end user defining the problem. But you have a whole lot of other folks who have other interests. I mean, ultimately, they're there to support taking care of the patient, but the subtext is, you know, we have issues that we have to deal with. And, and in my consulting work and working with people, an example is, so you have an IT mid-level person who's a, a, a systems analyst or an engineer or something like that, and they have to answer to their boss. And the boss has certain things that they need them to do that has little or nothing to do with actually getting it to the clinician. It's about the data. It's about security. It's about how do you create this and that and all that other business. So my question is, a long question, but the, the question is, so how do you deal with all these folks? I mean, it's great to say, get clinicians involved early in the process, but my experience is in the real world, you got all these people yelling and screaming around the table, what if, but how about this? And how's that gonna satisfy my need? And I only have this budget and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I wonder whether the group can address that question. Anthony, you wanna start? Yeah. You asked about 10 questions there, but um, right. I think right. the bottom line is, uh, as all of our great panelists have said in, in a way um, differently perhaps, but you need a organizational focus on leveraging what's happening in whatever you want to call it, um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, the resource is better than we've ever had before. And the important thing is to leverage that so that everyone is a better player at their game, uh, no matter where they are in the hospital. 
Um, as we talked about uh, earlier, most hospitals are still at a very descriptive level in their analytics. And sometimes they even say, well, they have an AI strategy, but it's really an analytics strategy <laughs> or a data strategy even. So it's kind of like, um, you know, everyone, if you um, draw the analogy of all the sectors that you mentioned, Arlen, to people who like different kinds of music, right? It ranges from Baroque to classical to jazz. Our jobs as AI or, or as um, ML uh, champions is to make sure that people just appreciate music and we assemble the appropriate tools or musicians to play that music. Uh, so we have to assemble the musicians, but also I think with what's happening now in the, in the technology area is that all the players are better now than ever before. So you have to leverage um, better players into doing a better job in healthcare. At the same time, you have to figure out how to please all the sectors that you mentioned. And it's a very different game when you go sector to sector. Um, we, we're building a clinician um, coalition, but it's hard to, to gain um, sort of acceptance or adoption in a C-suite, And uh, but we're working on it. And the way we work on it is say, uh, let's take one small area, just I, I think as David did, and let's just show you uh, what this is capable of doing. And I think you have to get that small win. That's a very easy win to really go to the next level with a C-suite, but we, we're uh, getting there. So I, I think it's, um, uh, again, you, you, you have an orchestra, you have musicians of better caliber now, and you just have to assemble, assemble the musicians of a higher caliber into playing different kinds of music to satisfy the people that want to hear that particular kind of music. Terry, you want to comment? How do you satisfy the needs of the multiple stakeholders? Well, I think it's um, at, the, at the institute we we have a very unique uh, approach of the of what we call the hard teams. So there is actually there is a, a book uh, that we have edited on that. So we have across the entire organization uh, a hard team approach. That means we have a hard team for um, uh, diseases like uh, coronary artery disease, valvular disease, arrhythmias, heart failure. And we have a hard teams focused on some research uh, like uh, women heart health. We have a critical care hard team. We have also cardiac imaging hard team. And now we have set up a virtual care hard team. So these hard teams multidisciplinary, I would say interprofessional disciplinary. So it's again, the same concept that engaging as many people as you can. So like for instance, the, the cardiac imaging uh, heart team is uh, we have representation of each uh, cardiac imaging modality. So echo, MRI, CT, uh, PET, uh, uh, different, uh, uh, di all the modalities. We have concentrated all this in the one big unit of cardiac imaging, and we have put a couple of IT people there. And so it's a multidisciplinary clinical IT. So they are all involved. So I think as the concept is to have a platform of discussion, like three, four times a year, they meet and they, 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 they have a, a goal for research, a goal for education, a goal for patient care. They have a project they have to put together and they are engaged in a project and, uh, and we monitor this constantly. So it's really an entire, uh, it's a really a philosophy, it's a culture. Uh, and I don't think there's any other organization actually that has that to, to this level across the entire organization like this. It take, took me like seven years to get it done. I mean, it doesn't happen overnight because people like to, they all say they work for the patient. You know, you don't find one single hospital who would not say I put patient first, not one single in the entire world. There's no, no, not a CEO who would say, oh, we see patient first. The truth is it doesn't happen. And there is not single hospital who say, oh, we work as a team, we work as a team. Where the truth is 90% don't really work as a team. They work in sequence, but they don't work in synergy, which is very different. Anyway, that's, it's a, so that we don't have all these problems because we just, it's a culture problem of the organization. And what you're describing, Arlen, what you have described before is a typical problem of very sequential approach of management of a hospital and segregated with blocks. And from time to time, these blocks talk to each other. So uh, Maya, do you agree with that perspective and do you have silos in Utah? Yes, of, of, well, one, I agree. And yes, we have silos. Um, 
One thing that COVID taught us is that we can be agile. It's amazing, and, and across the country, I think everyone has experienced how amazing uh, when we're all unified in a vision um, and a purpose, how quickly uh, we can come together to create new solutions, be agile, and um, really service the needs of our patients and our community um, in, this time, in that time of crisis. Now, what we've done over the last six months is, okay, how do we take that agility and formalize that, make that a standard process, recognize that, that there really is a need for a mode one and a mode two. Mode one being lights on, doors open, 24 seven availability, security, all the things that you described. Mode two is being agile, really having that product team approach where you're working directly with operations, understanding a problem, developing that MVP that is uh, built for, um, uh, that has that product market fit. Make sure that there's traction in that feedback loop a and then further refine it. Um, but then the product team, you know, is, is, is then sort of released from their duties, so to speak, um, and operations takes ownership and continues to evolve that model. And so we're still at the very beginnings of this journey that, um, that Tom, uh, our, my colleague, <laughs> uh, described, um, but wanting to create both a governance structure and an operating model that allows us to have that mode one, mode two, um, nimbleness, especially in, in that mode two, um, where all the stakeholder needs um, are being met. And one way that myself and our CIO are, are positioning this approach one is we did get some external consulting to help us um, define it as well as make the argument to our executive C-suite. And then two, make that connection between all of the things that are on our strategic plan that are digital and will not occur um, if we're, we don't have this capability of uh, working in an agile fashion. Uh, so I think that the, the message is resonating and we're still on the, the uh, the uh, listening tour, the, the, the selling tour. <laughs> um, but that, that's our approach um, as we have shifted our digital strategy over the last six months. David, you've, you've worn several hats in, in a lot of these different roles. So what is your perspective in terms of on the ground advice to listeners? How do you break, what, what's the next step? How do you break down these interfunctional, interprofessional uh, inter-role silos? How does that work? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I thought your, the way you structured the question between those different sections was very insightful. You know, I would first of all think that AI is very much in its infancy as a tool to solve problems. And, and when I say that, and less than the, the fact that the science itself, more of the understanding of people. So you described in your question kind of a very traditional process of finding a problem, brainstorming the solution, innovating and then implementing and when you do that with a group of people which we do all the time and i'm sure everyone else does when you have that initial brainstorming people are thinking about the levers that they already understand what what things have i done in the past that worked and which one of those things do i apply to this particular solution and there's a degree of comfort and understanding that i i know how to do a report i know how to buy a system from a vendor i know how to do all these other things i've done before and so they tend to grow in that traditional process they go down the path of what they already know. And so it is really, really hard to inject an AI ML discussion into that with all those stakeholders because they just frankly don't understand and they don't trust it. And it's too early yet for them to have seen demonstrated uh, cases. So in that scenario, that very structured scenario that we talked about, that kind of mode one, I guess, scenario of the traditional way of uh, approaching a problem, it is almost, it is very hard right now to bring that to bear uh, in any meaningful way and definitely get it all the way through the end of the process. The flip side of it, um, and what I try to do, and maybe in a fairly unique role, I mean, the reason I took these C-suite jobs fundamentally is because I'm an innovator and it was the one way for me not to have to answer to everybody because I'm the COO, I can just go do what I want to do. And luckily my CEO is very supportive of my kind of innovative streak and the same with our chief information medical officer. So. The reason I do the programming myself is, is because I can push it through and have a little bit of that complete vision myself and not necessarily have to get through all those steps you talked about. Now, at the end of the day for implementation, I've still got to kind of bring everyone together and explain it, but I don't have to get them through that selling phase at the start where I say, okay, I hear your problem. I think this is a solution. This is how we're going to do it. And people not understanding. So my approach is to use that kind of 
ram it home innovation process at the start to demonstrate the effect, efficacy, then people start to understand the way AI and ML fit in, and then it kind of falls back into that traditional process. And I would say at our institution, even though I showed you a few examples, we're still not at all at that point where someone comes into the brainstorming and says, oh yes, let's use AI for that, right? We're not even close to it. We have to, I even have for myself, continually ask myself, okay, it, can I reformat this as a prediction problem? How would I operationalize it? How And again, we're only at probably 5% of the problems where we're thinking like that. So I, I think there's hope for it. Other technologies have gone through this path before, uh, but I don't think we're nearly at the point where all those team members that solve a problem think about this as an, at an equal footing of the other solutions they come up with. And so adoption is going to be slow until it happens. But I think you have to have those champions, those MVPs that say, you know what, I'm a believer. I'm going to use my political clout and credibility. That's what I hear everybody doing today. And I'm just going to push it through and on my own back. And that's going to get it into the organization. And we've been doing that for years. I'm sure in medicine, that's how new equipment got in. That's how new practices got in. People were champions and they pushed it in. So, you know, we all have to keep doing that. But I think we're a long way from kind of the routine adoption by the different groups. Yeah, we've done a lot of work on uh, entrepreneurship and physician entrepreneurship and all the issues that you've talked about and how do you get from A to B and a lot of it has to do with mindset, a lot of it has to do with education, a lot of it has to do with culture and we can have another seminar on this all day long but uh, there's a lot of issues that we're all trying to deal with and, and move the ball forward. Um, and just um, one comment on that, I think one thing from a, a seat perspective, maybe an administration is people at that level aren't that interested in taking a high degree of risk, right? Because there's lots of consequences of, of taking that risk. And so we, these new technologies are often seen as risky. And uh, I think we have to kind of de-risk that approach a little bit or help people understand because otherwise just the, the lack of willingness to take on these risks um, can, can cause people just to say no. And that was one of the things I was referring to at the technology level where in some instances taking, you know, it's the old saying, nobody got fired for hiring IBM. Well, now you get fired if you screw up the AI implementation if you're in the IS department. So there's, there's a, and that's what I would mean. Like, you're not going to take that risk. It's career suicide to get involved with this. So somehow we need to kind of reformat it. And there's this term frame storming versus brainstorming. And frames, it's a, it's a term that, of, that was developed at Stanford in their business school. And it's a basically about let's reframe the question, not reframe and brainstorm the answer. So are, are we, have we framed the question correctly? And let's just spend time asking the right question. We'll eventually get to, you know, sticky notes for, for some ideas about the solution. But um, I think that's an important, uh, an important concept. So uh, Maya, I want to ask you, uh, because there's been a fair amount of conversation about what are CMIOs anyway? And what do they do for a living when your 55 year old asks you, what do you do when you go to work? So what is the role of the CMIO these days in, in terms of all of what we've been talking about? What do you folks actually, what do you think you're supposed to do? What's your job? Great question. No, uh, from your, when you were describing all those various stakeholders, generally it's the CMIO and our team of provider informaticists that keep that glue together or informaticists in general, whether it's nursing, pharmacy, informatics, nursing informatics, clinical informatics, um, informatics. That's what we do is we keep the glue of all those stakeholders uh, together to create better solutions, um, as well as to make sure that in that life cycle of um, a technology um, implementation, all the way from implementation, adoption, uh, dissemination, uh, that the true value of a system is, is being accomplished. Uh, so, you know, that's sort of like that high level. <laughs> we wear a lot of um, Kevlar. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, we, we try to, sometimes I call myself an overpaid therapist, you know, like the tears. The <laughs> um, traditionally, the traditional EH, um, CMIO really was focused on EHR implementation. Um, that has definitely evolved over the years to not only EHR implementation and now optimization, uh, but platform implementation and optimization uh, being that connection between the providers. And turns out, you know, physicians are a, an ornery group. If you can get the physicians 
um, you often can get a whole lot more value out of your investment in an IT solution than, um, than without the physician buy-in champion um, approach. So that's a, like, I would say the, the general, um, most CMIO, many CMIOs are really influencers. Um, I'm fortunate enough to actually also have uh, some resources and team. So I lead our data warehouse team as well. Um, predictive analytics, our um, data science services team that really services the needs of our uh, researchers, uh, providing medical informatics support for our research um, community, um, as well as a smart on fire team and uh, provider informatics. So um, I've got a, a pretty uh, big group of people that our, our vision is transformation of data into value and creating um, an exceptional experience with our IT systems. Uh, so those are the two big things. Is, um, is, it, is it your impression? I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Anthony. I was just gonna say, um, Maya would be happy to hear them and David too. I think it's a role that's gonna evolve into an even more important uh, uh, domain because I think I, I have jokingly say the chief medical information officer is gonna have to evolve in the future into the chief medical intelligence officer because it's not just uh, having data, make sure data is secure and you have a data strategy. You're gonna to have to figure out how to get that data as a resource into intelligible actions. And yep. I know it's a tribute to Maya and Dave and Deary that they're doing it almost as lone champions. Um, I would propose this, that, that we convince some of the other hospitals instead of breaking down the silos is to have an external source like Maya did to help you create a coalition. Because it's sometimes hard to build that coalition from within because uh, uh, I think um, maybe David can comment on this is what happens is when you're doing all the analytic stuff to, to affect change, what happens is then people, everyone thinks that, that you got that covered and no one else really needs to make a contribution um, because he's doing it so well and Maya's doing it so well, but you need to build that five to 10 champion coalition to really represent all the sectors in the hospital, uh, including um, the, um, uh, the clinical sectors, the administrative suite, and, and that's what we're slowly building. It took two or three years, but the CMIO is sort of that central person that can go to the C-suite and say, okay, we, we have sort of an, an, an intelligence or AI-focused coalition. We want to try a small project and in, in, in using RPA and, and uh, revenue cycle management. And because there's a coalition now rather than one champion, I think we're really getting our voices heard now as a whole entire coalition. So I think that coalition, and it's a tribute to David, Maya, and Terry that they can get all this done. Um, um, but, but I think you need eventually that, that uh, multi-dimensional coalition to really push towards an AI strategy, which is, I think the North Star that really raises your data IT analytics strategy in the organization. You, you, and I think, especially given the pandemic, Garland, this is the best time to think a little bit differently. And I think within a decade, we'll realize looking back to today and say, gosh, we were talking about just getting AI adopted for easy things back then, <laughs> because things are gonna get more sophisticated. We're gonna underestimate the value of this resource 10 years from now, just like David said, a lot of other modern technologies. Um, and just before we move on to another topic, uh, and just on monitoring the AMDIS site, uh, you know, the Association for Medical Directors of Information says the CMIO group, uh, that conversation tends to revolve around three things. Uh, what do I do with this EMR problem? Given regs and new stuff and updates and what are you doing and how do you deal with this problem and all that? Number two is what do we want to do when we grow up? And that's gets to Anthony's point, the sort of the evolving role of the CMIO. And the third is, what are the knowledge, skills, abilities, and competencies that CMIOs will need now and in the future to deal with the future growth of what we're talking about? And it's just my observation that there are significant education gaps and they're trying to figure out, well, what, what do we need to know? So, so I think that's, that's how this is, going to evolve. Do you agree with that, Maya? Yeah, I definitely agree with that 100% because we're even wrestling with um, how do we continue to train that next generation. And so we are launching, just like many, um, a clinical informatics uh, fellowship, uh, but we want to be different. We for, are very fortunate to have uh, both uh, at 
you know, operational responsibilities, as well as um, a Department of Biomedical Informatics uh, that is nationally and internationally renowned. And so um, our goal really is to create that sort of CMIO of the future uh, that has access to data, to uh, resources, uh, to machine learning tools, uh, to business intelligence tools, um, and an environment that's secure and safe where they can play around with. At the same time, with education, um, with the deep um, experience and expertise that our Department of Biomedical Informatics brings, uh, so that has uh, not only the you know inf the substrate of uh, data and tools, um, but also the knowledge base um, of some of our cutting edge researchers. Yeah, and I, I just comment on that. I mean, I couldn't agree with the evolution comment more. I think it actually also applies to CIOs. So I think CIOs have had to evolve from kind of the plumbers that built the network and the and the infrastructure guys to the project managers that got the big systems in. And the question is now, what do they become next? Really, my sense is process improvement people because they should now have had a good understanding of the whole organization. But if they don't evolve again, what they're going to be end up is like a director of facilities who the whole job is just to put desktops and network. And that's, that's a shame, but that will happen in some areas. But I also agree with the CMIO evolution and really the EMR evolution is you've got that implementation, which some people are still in that phase to get a solid implementation. You've got optimization, which I would argue most people are in the optimization process and are at different places in that journey. And then if you get past that, those two phases that you can then get to really exploit, I would say, exploitation of the EMR, which is why are we even typing this stuff in to start with? Right? Why, have we, why have we spent billions of dollars typing something into a computer with all the headaches that come if we don't do anything with the data on the outside? And I think the CMIO, the future, and certainly in our organization, sounds like you admires, we actually have a traditional CMIO who used to be the associate CMIO. They do the optimization stuff because that's still needed to be care and feeding. Our initial CMIO is really now our intelligence officer. He does all day, every day, Power BI. And if I, you know, at the end of my presentation, I show you those dashboards, that is fundamentally changing the way that we do work because he's extracting those data elements out of the EMR, putting them in a way that people can actually make actionable items on them. And they totally change the way they run the clinics. And so I do think this evolution is really critical. I think if you can keep, the problem is if you take a back step, you get forced back to do optimization. And even worse, when you have to re-implement the EMR, you take the steps all the way back again. And then you've got five years of your life kind of working it forward. So uh, I'm I'm very concerned in the next five years, we're going to see an evolutionary change in the EMRs, which is mean we're all going to go back to re-implementing the next generation of EMRs. It's pretty much every 10 to 15 years, those things change. Um, and then we might take a step back from really focusing on the data, because to me, the whole point of this versus writing it on a piece of paper or dictating is I can use the data for something more than just reading a document. And I... And I you know, I think the the uh, the C-suite, the, the CMIO and the CMIO have to lead that change. And if they're stuck back taking care of infrastructure, they're going to hold the organization back. You know, we have to let go of that. So those are my two cents on that. But I couldn't agree with more with you with that evolutionary change. And you have to push that change to happen because some people were very happy just doing what they did yesterday. David, I'm seeing also um, a convergence of all the intelligence minded people. And we're actually thinking of having just an intelligence unit. I mean, why should business intelligence be very different in terms of process and people and how they where to get data than a clinical intelligence unit? You know, we, we're trying to uh, converge, yeah. and I think that will unify all of the intelligence sources. But as you know, sometimes business intelligence can um, give you a very different conclusion than a clinical project, and it just seems very you know, discordant when you have different conclusions uh, because one is a clinical project and the other one is a business project. <laughs> yeah, I can remember myself and the CMI actually lead our data team together. And because I'm an accountant by trade, I do the business side and he does the clinical side. And that's fundamentally how we're driving those things forward. But I agree with you. I mean, you've got, you can't overweight it one way or the other. Um, and the value of bringing these data sets together outside their natural environment. So you have this big data warehouse where you can blend data together. You really do get extra insight. The day that we got the badge swipes added into our data warehouse so we can see every tap of every badge, that gives massive insight into where people are and what they're doing when you lay it on top of other data. And so I think we you know really, I mean, back to what you're saying, Anthony, is I don't think most hospitals even tapped into their descriptive data in a meaningful way yet. 
right? And so we've got to kind of keep the focus on moving that forward. Okay, so I want to move on to another topic, and that is um, a lot of people who are viewing this um, are not UPMC, Penn Health, Stanford, Utah, I mean, big powerhouse informatics, well-budgeted, well-staffed, you know, places. There are 200 bed hospitals all over the country. In some instances, they're rural hospitals that there's a 60% chance they're gonna go under. Uh, our critical access hospital with 25 beds and they're, they're, they just don't have the capability to do any of this. So my question is scalability and make or buy. So uh, David, you've had experience and, and a corollary to that is if you are a hospital buying team and, and you know what I mean by that, if you're part of the buying team and the vendor is trying to pitch God knows how many things to you, how do you decide which one to engage or do you do it yourself? And, and so that's the make or buy thing. So let's, let's start with the, the, the piece. Um, Terry, what, what are the considerations for, in your opinion, a smaller place? You're, you're just getting started with this. You wanna walk, crawl before you walk, before you run. You don't have a big budget. You may not even have a CMIO or you could be the CEO of a 100 bed hospital and you're the CIO and you're the CFO. And, I mean, your, your, your picture is in every box in the org chart. So how do you, how do you make, what are the issues about make or buy and scalability of these emerging technologies? Well, I think the small hospitals, they, they, have, they have no interest in AI. I mean, why would they? Why would they have an interest in AI? So I, I think they, they, they don't need to because the, the, the data that we have are not sufficient, right? So what you need to have is in my, in, in, I think all the discussions you had before are very interesting, but I believe like the story about AI is like the story of people who write novels. There is no one who has the secret bullet to write a successful novel. You can, all the famous novelists, they all have different, different stories, how they achieve a, a great book. I think every hospital has its own environment, its own microcosm, its own people. And the job of a CEO is to understand what data do I have in my hospital? What are the sources? And this is when you get the surprise because then you're just surprised to see, oh my God, you have these hundreds of databases clinical, non-clinical, and how do I harmonize that? How do I get the people together? How do I move forward having a, a synergy between all these databases? This is the first thing that the, 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 the CEO has to do in these small hospitals because they have not epic for the last 15 years, right? So how do they do that? So then they have to find partners. So they have to, 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 to talk to bigger hospitals and try to get into the EMRs. This is what we have done here. We have six or seven smaller hospitals in the region, like three, four, 500 kilometers from Ottawa, even, even 700, Canada is a huge country, twice bigger than the US. And, and we, have, we have people coming for 2000 kilometers from North. So we have these little places and we partner with them and they don't buy the EMR, we buy it for, for them. But for us, this is what allows us to treat patients remotely, to do telehealth, virtual care, so then they part of the family, they are together. So they don't have this dilemma, oh my God, what is it? They, the AI is the last thing they're gonna want, they want to think about this small hospital, the last thing. So the question is not even on the table for them. They just want to have a reasonable EMR. That's what they need. And then, and then the thing that you have not so talked too much is research. You mean, you, you know, my C, I don't have a CMIO. I have a CIO and I have a chief data scientist, which is a physician. And a, who is, is a physician who does 50% clinical work, 50% data science. And I have three or four guys who are really interested in data science. This is how I mix these clinical people with the IT people. But I don't have a CMIO. I'm not like a 2000 best hospital, but it's, it's a very large institute with a lot of data. When I took over, I found I had 48 different databases. 48 clinical databases. 
And then you have the administrative database. So as, as David was saying, first of all, you need to have to understand what data do you have and how do you use the data that we have? And then you go to the prediction. The first thing is to use the, the analysis of the data that you have. So to answer briefly your question, really the small hospitals have a very different problem than, than the big hospitals have. The last thing they should do is try to copy what the big hospitals are doing. So David, having said that, I I think um, I'm going to I'm going to respectfully um, disagree with David a little bit. I, I think it's just a matter of timing, David, that if you're a lead healthcare executive and you have no clue what data and databases are and you don't know how to leverage that for information and insight, I think it's just a matter of time. Um, more and more people are going to understand that and replace you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, for sure. I think that's um, just inevitable, even if you're a CEO of a small hospital, but if you don't either, if you don't either hire people that are really good at this, like David, or you can, or you appreciate it yourself, it's going to be very obvious that you're going to be left behind uh, and not, not uh, sort of linearly for the next decade, but I think there's going to be a breaking point two, three, five years from now, that's going to be very obvious that the hospitals that leverage data, just like in other sectors in our society, right? In manufacturing, in sales, in, in, in uh, if you're not leveraging data and information and they're getting very sophisticated at it too, uh, in healthcare. And we're just, we're guilty of, of being inefficient for so long that it's gonna take longer, but soon enough, there's gonna be that breaking point that if you have very little knowledge in this area, you're just gonna be um, very, have a very, very big sizable disadvantage. I think the question was really about bill versus buy. So I think rather than kind of saying we're not going to do it at all, I think the question is, how do you get it done? Because if you are a 150 bed community hospital, there is no, I mean, I'll tell you, even Phoenix, me trying to even recruit and retain a data scientist is almost impossible, right? So, so it's not, so you would argue potentially the build is off the table altogether. And, and I think then the, you know, the, the, CEO and CIO of that 150 bed hospital can definitely be data aware and understand the value of data, but I think building it themselves is somewhat unrealistic. So I think then you have to look to Alan's question about when do you buy versus build. And, and unfortunately, there is a lot of FUD out there where vendors are using the words like AI and ML, and it's very confusing to someone who doesn't spend hours in that field. And it is really difficult to kind of tease through that information. Uh, you know, my general suggestion to those guys, which I talk to those kind of folks all the time, is fundamentally trust your EMR vendor. I mean, that's the, at the end of the day, they're the people who are with you for a long period of time. You've made a big investment with them. If you've got to trust somebody, I would trust them over trusting some fly by night company that says this week I've got AI and then next week doesn't have anything. So, you know, that, and that is an easy thing to implement it, kind of something maybe I've already bought. The other comment I'd make is that. I think there are AI and ML type things that are coming forward that can be adopted at all hospitals. And I would kind of point to things like the Rothman index in pediatrics, it's the Pew score, these early warning scores about a patient who's decompensating very quickly. Those algorithms are getting fairly robust, fairly transferable and being embraced by the big vendors. I think Epic even has something like that today. Um, those are maturing and they're getting well understood. And even if it's just an evolutionary change rather than a revolution, I think that is a way those tools are being slowly accepted into the, the product. And so I would, you know, my advice always is for those guys, if you could just accept, you can't build it unless, because even if you can build it today, can you maintain it tomorrow? Right. That's the bigger question we ask ourselves. If I can hire a data scientist for six months, if they get poached away, what the heck am I going to do with all that investment? So I, I really think the buy and, my advice would be kind of start first with your EMR vendor because they have the most to lose if they give you something that doesn't work. Yeah, and building upon that and what Terry's um, comment is, you know, don't uh, make use of your partnerships. Uh, without a doubt, there isn't a single, not that I'm aware of, small hospital, at least in the Intermountain West, that doesn't have some connection with us here in the University of Utah. Um, and whether it's a formal, um, implementation of the EHR through, say, Epic Connect or some of the other type of Connect programs, um, which uh, previously I was at the University of Iowa, and the Connect program was extremely robust with the small regional hospitals within the state of Iowa. Uh, for the state of Iowa, it was part of the mission of the University of Iowa to ensure that 
the small community hospitals uh, continue to serve the rural needs of the citizens of the state of Iowa. Uh, so, so important that that access be maintained. And at the same time that the Academic Medical Center is able to provide support um, to the region uh, through shared resources, whether it's the EHR knowledge, uh, definitely keeping that knowledge base, the continuing medical education, um, and then to, again, to Terry's point, uh, that network of whether it's teleradiology, telestroke, tele uh, virtual care, um, where what needs to come to the academic medical center uh, comes to the academic medical center, what ought to stay in the community stays in the community, and what it's in between is a hybrid um, where the, the rural community, the small hospital is supported. Um, and so similarly with AI um, and, and um, infra IT infrastructure in general, uh, leveraging partnerships, so important, I think, for these small, smaller hospitals so that you don't, you're not going it alone and you, you know that uh, whatever you buy um, is going to integrate with your, your EHR and, and with your overarching platform. Okay, um, so we've talked about a lot of things and we sort of touched on a couple of workforce development things. I mean, you've meant, I mean, try to find a data science in healthcare anywhere. I mean, it's impossible, particularly, I was talking to a guy who's at UPMC and literally his office is below the Google office in Pittsburgh. Well, he's trying to compete for folks that are making twice what he could pay. It's the same thing all over the country and probably in the world. So the question really is, how do you develop the workforce of the future? Now we're talking obviously pre-med, medical school, residency, I mean, all, you know, all lifelong learning thing. So, and how do we assure diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is a big deal now? So Maya, um, what advice would you give to, because actually yesterday in the New England Journal, there was an editorial entitled Misogynist Medicine. And it was written by a woman who is a academician and she was reiterating all the trials and tribulations of, which I don't obviously need to tell you about being in healthcare. And I think we all experienced the toxic culture of medicine, which is sort of this dirty little secret in the dark underbelly and sexism isn't the only one. I mean, we all have experiences. So for the women who are listening to this, who are interested in this subject, what is your perspective? Or, and I would just mention that uh, thanks to Anthony, I had the privilege of talking to his interns who are high school kids and some a little bit later, community college, college, some are pre-meds, all that. So what advice would you give to those folks? I mean, we're talking about the medical persona of 2030. If you're a woman, Interesting. Yeah. If you're a woman, if you're underrepresented minority, um, my message would be, we need your perspective. We need your real world experience. And in order to have that diversity of input, uh, that really is right now, the only neutralizing factor against bias in, in AI and bias in healthcare. Uh, so without that diversity of perspective, we build to suit, right? We overfit our solutions. Uh, to a, a population that we're most familiar with. No, that, that Im implicit, unintentional, it's just you know, human nature. And so by having diversity within our workforce, by having diversity within our data scientist community, uh, we help to mitigate against, against a lot of that. So if, you're, if you have an interest, please, we need you. Um, if you are, uh, even a, as a social justice, um, I think that it's important that we echo that to our next generation, how important it is to have the diverse um, presence within medicine, within AI, within data right. science. So there's, there's obviously, I mean, there's lots and lots of business cases and social cases. Yes, and social, exactly. I mean, we, we all kind of understand the case for diversity. The question is, what are you doing about it? And, and what are the issues? So yeah, uh, what it, are you doing about it? I mean, that's, that's right. the big, the, the challenge, right? So for us, we do have a robust pipeline program all the way from kindergarten. And that's again, we're a university. So um, most of the universities are gonna have similar type approaches 
uh, really trying to tap into the diversity of our community, uh, get those students even as young as kindergarten. <laughs> and heck, the pipeline, you could arguably say preschool, um, but getting uh, the folks into aware of, of health sciences as a career opportunity around data and data sciences as a, a career opportunity um, from our pipeline programs. And we're actually even further robusting, making our pipeline programs more robust, um, having that, that ability to track and, and perhaps even use AI around um, helping to better support our students um, over time uh, so that if they are say at risk of attrition, how can we identify a need that may be just temporary and solvable uh, to, to continue to, to keep those uh, pipeline students within the pipeline. So between pipeline programs and they go all the way, you know, all the way through residency, um, our various um, initiatives and um, our hope is that we are training the that next generation of diverse um, folks, and we do have some of the numbers just to show that. Do you, do you have a mandatory course in just writ large data science or bioinformatics at the University of Utah Medical School? Not yet, not at this point. I think that's, and even um, the, the School of Medicine is reevaluating its curriculum as nationally. So nationally, that's a, an ongoing topic of discussion is how do we, we uh, reshape the curriculum in order to meet the needs of the future. So uh, it, the reason I bring that up is obviously there's a conversation going on about educate, medical education reform, residency training reform, continuous learning reform, CME reform, I mean, everything's gonna be touched upside down. So my question to the group is, and particularly in Canada, I'm interested in, in your, from your perspective, where are the gaps in medical student knowledge, skills, abilities, and competencies when it comes to data science and just data. Not, I mean, we're not saying everybody's got to be a data scientist, but I think we're trying to convey the impression this is pretty going to be pretty important and you need to know how to know something about it. You know, you need some data literacy. You need to know how to read the literature. You need to know how to what's smoking, what's not. So what, what's going on in Canada in that regard in terms of where are the gaps in data large capitals education in Canada, and what are the initiatives, if any, to fill them in medical schools? I would say there is, in, in data science, there are maybe three or four universities that are uh, very uh, significantly loaded with uh, data science education. Uh, Toronto University is definitely very powerful. Uh, uh, Montreal is a big hub. The government has decided there will be three big hubs for AI and artificial intelligence, the federal government, and there'll be a, another one in Calgary. Ottawa is growing now, so in terms of medical education. But to follow on this discussion, what I think is a major obstacle for promoting data science is the mode of revenue for physicians, is the mode of remuneration. These data scientists don't make any money out of this. So the, even if you're very interested in data science, how are you going to make money? So I have appointed me here, I have appointed the chief data scientist, actually a woman from a minority, by the way, but I have to provide 50% of her salary from the hospital funds because she she would have to, to take out of her time and the, she's not like an interventional cardiologist or a heart surgeon who can have, who can with 60% of clinical load be uh, doing a, a ton of money. So they. They, they need to be supported financially to have protected time. This is part of the package that we have to offer. We have to make it attractive. So we have very early on in the medical school, we have to tell these people, data science is a great career if you combine it with clinical care and you can have a great career doing both data science and clinical care and, and go wide and make sure that you, you pay attention to these uh, uh, visible or less visible minorities and, and because this is a way, of, this is a great way of expression of the future. And, and I think in the young people, you're gonna find more and more of these young people going into medical school, very keen to work on AI and data science. There's no doubt. I mean, there's a new generation. I don't think we're gonna have a problem to find the people. It's how to make them understand they can have a great future, like if they were a neurosurgeon or a heart surgeon as important as a heart surgeon or a neurosurgeon. And I think that's the challenge we have. And the last thing I want to say, 
it's the responsibility of the leaders, the deans, the CEOs, to appoint women in leadership position. If you don't, until you do that, nothing happens really. You, we, if, if we don't appoint, appoint more women in more leadership positions, things will not happen as quickly. So the quicker we have more than 50% of CEO being women, more than 50% of the dean being women, then you're going to see the change. Baya, how's your friend? Terry, coming back to your um, compensation issue, why not, as Dave and I were talking about earlier, have your business and clinical intelligence bundled so that the money you save from the business side can, can maybe provide a reasonable stipend for your clinical positions because everyone's yeah. doing intelligence. And why, why separate business and clinical so that you know, you're more focused on the money side on the business, but you're, you're right, the clinical side needs to be supported too, but you can have, have both sides. Okay, so let's, uh, we have about 20 minutes or so to go. So let's kind of shift a little bit to strategy. Um, so what are the, uh, um, what are your, the considerations uh, concerning uh, strategy? If you're, you know, sort of you're, again, you're, you, you may be in various stages of engagement, whether it's just awareness, intention, decision, action, enablement, whatever, wherever you are on the spectrum. Um, first of all, you know, most people define strategy as, you know, simplistically, where are we now, where do we want to go and how do we want to get there? And um, essentially, where do we want to play and how do we want to win? So those are kind of the core elements of, the, I mean, there's a lot of stuff, obviously, but those are the core questions. So David, um, you've been in the weeds in this for a long time. So if someone asks you, what do I need to know about digital health strategy and particularly as it applies to what I call digital soup? Because now what we're seeing, and Maya is an example in a presentation, we're not just seeing telemedicine, we're seeing remote patient monitoring, we're seeing patient reported outcomes, we're seeing virtual reality, we're seeing in, in all kinds of like HR analytics, which is kind of creepy to some people, like you're kind of like looking at my email and figuring out what I'm going to quit or not, all the societal implications. So, so my question is, if you're a hospital executive and you're thinking of going down this road and you've been told, well, the first thing you need is a strategy, how would you respond to that? And, and kind of fill in the blanks a little bit. Yeah, well, I would say we, I wouldn't have an AI strategy, honestly. I think it is a tool and tool belt. And just to, you know, touch on the other, on the last conversation is, you know, my perspective and maybe controversial is we don't need people, more people who know data science. I am very, very happy with these automated ML tools. And I think for a vast majority of people that opens up that field without having to have a human doing the work. Now you may argue with me, those tools are no good, but I don't need a data scientist. What I need is, what I've always needed is curious people that are going to take their knowledge in subject matter areas of healthcare and, and say, okay, there's a better way to do this and let me go find the better tool. And I would think back, you know, we don't, we don't have people who are Excel experts anymore. If I need to use a spreadsheet, I don't go ask someone who's the Excel expert and go have them do it for me. I've learned over time to have that tool to augment my skills. So, so I don't personally think there is a massive need to pump up the data science pipeline. I think there is a need to have people understand the opportunity that AI poses, but actually generating and doing the button, the, the kind of keyboard clicks, I'm, I'm less inclined to. And you may all not agree with me, but that's my perspective because I don't think we can grow enough data scientists in the time needed, no matter what. Um, but in terms of a strategy, I would agree. So one thing, I'll, an observation is, and I've seen this more and more is, big hospital systems are switching away from investing their IT dollars in internal systems. So the last 20 years we spent turning everything into a computer system everywhere in the hospital and not include, you know, definitely the EMR, but every other part of the hospital is now electronic in some way. We never really touched the patient side of things. We were very, very focused on how to make our providers use electronic systems. And so what I'm seeing is a wholesale shift in terms of IT dollars being deployed to 75% with patient facing systems and only 25% back to internal systems because there's a sense we're done with those. Um, and so if there's a strategy, our strategy is we have got to really think way more about the consumer experience. COVID taught us that, the fact that hospitals couldn't book appointments, couldn't do telehealth, couldn't collect forms in a seamless way like a restaurant can. 
you know, restaurants pivoted in five minutes to let you order everything online, no matter what. And hospitals really struggled with that. I knew people six months into the pandemic still hadn't got telehealth stood up, you know, because of all their challenges. So I think the strategy from my perspective is complete focus on the patient and swinging the, and I'll tell you one other area is swinging that pendulum that's been swung very heavily to build systems that, that assist the physicians and making their workflow very seamless and not necessarily assisting the patient. So when we, in our hospital, we had patient appointing, the only way you can book an appointment is call, is we're gonna call you between eight and five when it's convenient for us to call you. Only way you can get an appointment, okay? And if the physician said, you know, I don't want you booking this person next to this person, or this is the way I like to use my template, that's what we did. We never thought about what's convenient for the patient. And so when we started changing that pendulum and let the patient decide, when do I want to book the appointment or I want to refer myself because I think I need to be seen and not have go through this endless clinical review by a physician, we start to swing that pendulum a little bit back towards the patient. And that is our strategy. So it's not necessarily a whole set of tools. It is about putting the patient much further and closer to the front of the equation and not you know, I would argue in many hospitals, you know, their thoughts and needs are only often 25% of the thought process because inside the hospital as administrators, I hear from the physicians all the time. I rarely hear the voice of the patient, right? And so we are trying really, really hard to do that. And I think that's a trend that I see because the last comment is someone told me a long time ago, healthcare is the last bastion of no customer service, right? We are the one of the last areas that have not adopted the customer service trends of all the places. And if we don't, other people are going to come along and do it. So I, I do think that change is coming. Um, along with the final point is I believe that what FIRE is going to end up doing is allow me to have a broker application like Orbitz or something like that, where I go out and say, I've got a broken leg, get me the highest quality, lowest cost, and it's going to rank 15 hospitals because it's going to use FIRE to go pull all that data. And once you get something like that as a, as a disruptor, just like Uber did or Orbitz did, I think lots of things are gonna change quickly. Um, so long answer to your question, but uh, that's where I think it's going. Yeah, right now, totally. right I was now, just gonna say, yeah. oh, sorry. Yeah. I was gonna just uh, build upon what David said. We're actually exact same approach. Um, we're recognizing right now we're very uh, provider centric. We need to be consumer centric. And so it's even beyond just patient centric, but extremely um, ultimately consumer centric. And even further, how do are we marketplace centric? Uh, so changing that that paradigm, Arlen, you mentioned that you know changing the frame set um, where it's no longer about what we offer the marketplace and making sure that we put it out there and see who takes it. No, design the suit for the marketplace and building those relationships, those partnerships um, with non traditional partners. Uh, so we've definitely been expanding our partnership ecosystem as well. Um, across uh, both a traditional, say, health science provider or um, pharmaceutical and other organiz organizations to those non-traditional partners, um, whether they be the big AI, big data giants out there, uh, but cultivating those relationships as well so that we are, um, again, shifting our focus from consumer, from patient provider-centric, uh, patient-centric, uh, consumer-centric, because you're always a consumer, only part-time a patient uh, to the marketplace. Yeah, we've sort of gone from being a high touch, and this is just my view, a high touch to a high tech, to a low trust system. And some would argue that we are now, that we meaning the medical industrial complex of which I include all of us, are basically a data industry that's happened to take care of patients. So we're sort of losing, like, why are we doing this? And, and so I think what you're saying sort of reflects that theme. Uh, whether you get there or not is, is, of course, another story and involves all the elements we've been talking about for the last hour and a half. So Terry, what are you doing at your place to be more, quote, customer focused? Oh, well, I tell you, this is, the, the first value of the Institute, the patient first for us, like I talked to you about the heart teams. I forgot to tell you in each heart team, which is an internal process, we have at least one or two patients invited. So the patients come like if they are physicians, they listen to what the physician says and they have to say what they think about the plan of, of this is hospital management. So in each heart team, we have that. But I think one thing I like to say about COVID COVID will be 
the, the seminar event for healthcare because we have currently, we have 75% of the patients still seen remotely. When we answer the patients, are you happy with that? They are very happy. They're very happy not to have to find a parking place, to have to, tape, to pay parking. They have a video conference. They, we have Epic. They, they are extremely happy about delivering care remotely. So we have our administration offices are empty for 15 months. We have no, our, our clinics are empty, but we see more patients than ever before. And the patients are happier than ever before. So if we don't understand this, if we don't take lessons from this, I think we are unable to proceed. We have, we, if we understand what patients want, if we ask them, we will do the right things. And when I talk about AI, it's all about that. It's not just the physician who has this fancy idea how to use AI. How does it serve the patient? For us, the project I mentioned about prediction, it was very important because I wanted to make sure that the patients were safe at home and not wait, dying while waiting because of COVID. And I also wanted to have less cancellation for ORs because of COVID. So we ended up between reducing the cancellation rate, doing more cases, and patients very happy. So the end, the end of the game of medicine is to make people happy, to make patients happy. So if AI doesn't do that, AI has no purpose. Even if you make more money, even if you make it more efficient, at the end of the day, if AI doesn't make patients more happy, you fail with AI the same way. So I'm gonna push back a little bit with all due respect. And uh, some would argue that uh, convenience care is not quality care. And what makes you think because if you just make it convenient to get lousy or wasteful or potentially harmful care, you're not solving the problem. And I think that patients are telling us they like convenience care. I'm not disagreeing with that. Doctors like convenience care. Nobody wants to burn out. But the point is, it's about value. It's about quality per unit price. So I guess my question is of the group, there is no Moore's law in sick care. In other words, every time we add a technology, it just piles on more cost. Now, I don't know what's going on in Canada, but I can tell you in the US, our spend again will go up 5%. We're now at 3.9 trillion, approaching four in the not too distant future. And we just keep piling on more stuff. So my question is, what makes you think, I mean, I think we have, a social responsibility to reduce the aggregate cost of care. I don't care where it is in the world. What makes you think that everything we've talked about in the last 40 an hour and 45 minutes is going to reduce the aggregate cost of care? You asked me the question, you want me to answer? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, tell me what's going on. I mean, is the, is the Canadian government going to give you less money? to do what you're doing because but don't oh, you're doing a great job. We don't have to spend as much money. But don't forget the Canadian government gives money to doctors in a separate envelope on fee for service, like you guys in the States. So the Canadian doctors have the luxury to work in a publicly funded system, but they still have make money like if they were in the States, maybe not the same amount, but not, not so different. So my answer is very simple. We, as far the doctors drive the healthcare system, don't make, Nobody can, uh, can, can contradict this. Most, the most healthcare system has been built by doctors. It's doctors driven, whether we like it or not, whether we, we, we accept it or not. The big decisions in healthcare systems are always driven by doctors because they are the one who put patients to consume healthcare. You know, if every doctor, so that's the big problem. US problem is that there is a hyper consummation of healthcare needs. People abuse the system. And if they have the right insurance, well, they pay. Same thing in here, maybe to, to a certain extent. So that's the main problem. If you lead, if you let the physicians, and I'm a physician, if you let the physician drive the decision-making process all the time around fee for service, it will always go up. And then there is this coalescence with industry because you have this monster, and this is the biggest area of growth in, in the business is healthcare. 
and now it's not only healthcare equipment, medical equipment, is IT and technology. So at the end of the day, you have to control this. That's the main problem that people have in healthcare. We have to go away from the healthcare which is designed by physicians and not by patients. So David, uh, what are your thoughts about this, particularly as it applies to pediatric populations in the pediatric world? Because you guys have some unique challenges. Yeah, so we went from uh, 300,000 patient visits in person in February last year to 100 that to taking 60% of those and making them online during the COVID pandemic. And now we've settled out to about 20% of our visits are at telehealth. What I would tell you, because I we have family advisory councils, which are like our family focus groups, and I sit on those every month. The don't underestimate how savvy the patients and their families are about the costs. You talked about the kind of wasteful, you know, I definitely, I've seen urgent care visits over telehealth. They're like, oh my God, I got part, charged a hundred dollars for absolutely nothing versus someone to listen to my problem. But families very quickly figured out if they have a telehealth visit and then they were set, the person said, well, I can't do that because you're not in person. Now you've got to come in person. They very quickly started screening themselves out to say, you know what? I don't want the telehealth visit because I know I'm going to have to pay a second copay. So our families figured that out in the first month. So I think the families uh, or the patients are getting pretty savvy about that, or they will get savvier. What we found is it's not a binary decision. What we found more than anything for pediatrics, at least, is that maybe two out of the four visits for that chronic patient for the month can be done via telehealth, and two of them need to be done in person. And our physicians very quickly figured out the blend that worked. But what I will tell you is they did find those two out of four are totally fine to do from home. And from a specialty children's hospital, I've got patients who live 300 miles away. And I heard a story from a mom who had a chronic, a chronic patient, a child, and she was driving to Phoenix three times a week from a place that was 200 miles away. Her family was in 200 miles away. She couldn't move to Phoenix. And so she spent her life on the road. And she said, this pandemic has completely changed our lives because we only come to Phoenix now once every two weeks. The care of my patient is exactly the same, right? And I know I can always come. So I've got lots of stories like that. In fact, our legislator in Arizona just passed a bill that compensated the hospital the same for telehealth as for in-person. Now, I actually don't think that's, there's a, there's a very complicated transaction there because hospitals are built physical um, space, which they have to pay depreciation on to, yeah. to have patients. So we can't suddenly have everyone going to telehealth and getting paid half the price. So this is definitely a transitional phase, but to get paid the full amount for telehealth, yeah. if the visit's only 15 minutes and you don't need a physical space, something's got to adjust. Um, but I do I, think there's a place for this. So go ahead. Actually, that pay for parity thing, I think is a smoke screen. There's about 23 states that have paid for parity prior to COVID. You, that said you would get paid the same amount if you saw them face to face, but it, and it didn't move the needle. So there's a whole lot of issues that we don't have time to go into, but you're right. There's, it's a very complicated, wicked problem, and, and, and it's multidimensional. Now, I will, I will say that I do think there is opportunity for this disruption to happen, like in other industries, where once the quality and the cost of healthcare can be evaluated in a way that people can rank. Now, your concern is that they will put cost ahead of quality, so they'll pick the cheapest provider and the low quality. But I think if there's a way that we can blend those two things together and people can get good outcomes at lower costs, I do think that will drive costs coming down in the US healthcare system. Because, and I think we, we are moving away from fee from service. So we are on a lot of bundled at risk contracts that definitely drives the change. But you know, I, I would agree with you, the cost of healthcare in the US is way too high compared to, other, compared to the outcomes. Yeah. If you had to rebuild a hospital, let's see a beautiful hospital behind you. If you had to rebuild the hospital today, would you build it the same way? The same way, space for administration, space for clinics, space for how would you build it? Well, uh, we would build it differently, but I don't know how we'd build it because I've got. We were just about to go build a new office building before COVID, and now we're asking ourselves, do we need to build it? However, the exactly. innovation, and, the innovation and creativity in our organization has dropped off with everyone being remote. There is an implicit. If you're there in the moment and solving problems, innovating in the moment, you get, I believe you get more advances than you do by everyone being remote. So we're being extremely careful with our decision making and not just saying, let everyone work remote who's a corporate worker, because they do bring something to the equation. And I'm also very conscious is there is always already enough tension between administration and corporate and the caregivers on the front line. And if we now change the paradigm and said, you know what, all the corporate can, people can work from home, but all the caregivers have to be in every day, that just drives a bigger wedge 
between everybody. So I, I think this is an interesting time, but we're way too soon to kind of answer that question is how would you rebuild a hospital? You know, Jerry, if you're interested, uh, it would be different. I was on yeah. a panel two days ago with a guy who is the, uh, I forgot his main title, but he's a big muckety muck at Penn Health in Philadelphia. They are in fact just finishing a five year innovation pavilion. It's a brand new hospital. It's totally wired. And they asked that very question. Now they asked it five years ago because now they're just getting around to kind of open a thing. He says they're gonna open it like in the fall. So if you're interested, I'll connect you to them. But it, it was a pretty interesting story how they answered that very question. My take is it looks like the building behind David, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's wired differently. I guess it's configured differently. The workflows are different, you know, the whole deal. I, I don't think, you know, I don't think we're going to see brick and mortar Barnes and Noble go away. It's a digital strategy. But the question is, where, where's the balance given the forces that are moving forward. I mean, you just well, can't, you, can, you know. Yeah, you and even really with this bring... disruption, I was just gonna say that with this, you know, COVID obviously has created a huge disruption, especially with the acceleration of digital, how it's going to affect the healthcare value equation here and spend in the US is, is yet to be determined, but especially since we have new entrants into the marketplace from Amazon Health to Google to Apple, um, in addition to who, who have that consumer centric, uh, marketplace centric view, um, as well as you know ourselves and how we adapt, uh, yet to be seen. But I do think that uh, hopefully, with hope, <laughs> I'm optimistic that given that we're more data centric than ever, uh, that we will be driving down the cost, the total cost of care in the US. I'm gonna push back and say, high tech and high touch should not be mutually exclusive. Um, and I think you can have both. Oh, it is uh, a hybrid fact, world. You, yeah, as a matter of fact, you might need both um, because you know I'll give an example. Not only should hospitals look different, in my opinion, I think the room should look different. Um, we, we're actually seriously considering, um, you may like this, David and, and uh, Terry and, and Maya, is, is we, we think seriously thinking about getting rid, rid of the exam table. I mean, that's been around for a hundred years or more probably when you go see the doctor. And if you have enough smart technology built into the room, you probably don't need an exam table and, and things that weigh people. And I mean, I mean, all of that you can't get rid of, but it does require a, the right combination of sensitivity to the patient as the North Star at the same time, leveraging technology, however you want it. Now, we're thinking about Putting, uh, getting rid of the computers in the room and putting a big screen with the EHR so, so that patients don't feel like the doctors has, has exclusivity to the information that's gonna be shared for all parties in the room. So I think that's leveraging tech high technology for high touch. And I think it's capable of liberating the clinicians in some degree. Because right now, you know, um, a lot of clinicians as you know are tapping away at the keyboard uh, during a visit, which I think is really uh, personally just not acceptable. Okay, well, I want to thank, uh, we're at the end of the session and I want to thank all of you for your uh, enlightened, engaged and enthusiastic smiling faces and a lot of great ideas. I just want to end this on one final note in 15 seconds. What's your final uh, shot? What's your ending piece of advice to people in the audience, David? I would say, don't be, don't be scared if you're not a data scientist, give it a shot. Uh, and, and be curious and be that connected between the data side and the clinical side. Anybody can do that if you're curious enough. Terry? I would say something similar. I think you don't need to, to have a, a huge infrastructure for AI, but you can be part of a, of a, a process and uh, you just use some AI tools to get your operations better and, and maybe access uh, a better access for patients and put always patients at the, at the center. Maya? Yep, and from that, from patient to center to the healthcare consumer at the center, and how do we flip the model so that we're able to service their needs and vice, not vice versa? Uh, the health system really should be about meeting the needs of our consumers. Anthony? I think to best serve our um, patients and clinicians and hospital administrators, we cannot afford not to have a new resource. Things are so bad and so inefficient as this pandemic has shown we really need a new paradigm. So again, David, Maya, Terry, Anthony, 
Great job. Thanks for being with us. I'm Arlen Myers uh, at, uh, thanks for joining us at AI Mid, and we'll see you at uh, future programs. Have a good one. Thank you, guys.